we now will be joined by Greg Watson, the Director of Policy and Systems Design at the Shoemaker Center for, a, for New Economics. He has spent over 40 years learning to understand systems thinking as inspired by Buckmeister Fuller and to apply that understanding to achieve a just and sustainable world. He will be speaking about the wisdom that builds community. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Massachusetts. Welcome, Greg. It was an easy trip, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna probably shift gears a little bit and talk about land if I can from the, um, the urban perspective, if I can mm -hmm. get my, here we go. Great picture. Uh, can people, is that good? Can people? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes, we can see you. Okay. Uh, let's do that. Um, yes, um, I'm, I'm using sort of a case study of the Dudley Street Neighbor Initiative that will, I hope will sort of capture the issues surrounding some of the uses of urban land relevant to what we're trying to accomplish here. And it's a great story and I do think it embraces a lot of both the struggles and the promise. Um, and um, I'm gonna start with just on form follows vision. And in the case of uh, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, the vision was de is development without displacement. We seem to get locked into sort of this, this um, sort of coupling of poor communities that are trying to, um, and I will say this, trying to gentrify. Gentrification is not the, not the problem. The problem is gentrification coupled with displacement. Uh, when people feel that they've raised the, 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 the level of living in a particular community, but that inevitably leads to higher um, property values and taxes, and then they're forced to leave. And is there a way to sort of avoid that? So the vision of this particular community was to create an urban village. That was sort of had a lot to do with embodies both values and scale and resident participation. So that was the vision that this community set out to, um, to establish. The theory of change, I think I'm not necessarily, no, I know I'm not imposing this on Dudley Street. I was there for four years as its executive director. And I do think the, the vision of change that we operated under was um, articulated by Bucky. And that is you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the obsolete model and talk about the new model that I think Dudley and other communities have established. Uh, sources of community wealth um, that we work with. One is people, the other is land. It's not the only, only sources of wealth, but they are the primary sources of wealth, at least for those of us community organizers working in the Dudley community. And both of them were a bit of a struggle. Um, the struggle in terms of the people had centered around education. And I came to Boston in 1967 when the city was in the midst of uh, court ordered busing to um, with the purpose of integrating segregated schools. Um, it was a difficult time, but it, it does uh, sort of exemplify the fact that when it comes to education for communities of color, it was a struggle. I'm gonna talk about how acquiring land is a struggle. Um, and I do think that from, in my opinion, I was getting a little bit of a tussle with this. The, the issue was not so much, busing was not really, and integrating the schools was certainly an important part, but I do think the, the key thing that people were looking for was equal access to quality education. And if they weren't getting it in their neighborhoods, they, they were willing to go somewhere else. But the idea was that even that in and of itself was a disruptive process for communities, if you stop and think about it, because in many cases, one of the major factors in determining where you might want to live and buy a home is your school. <laughs> where, where are the schools for my kids? And then if you land in a place and all of a sudden realize that you're not going to be able to, you're going to really have to take your kids and put them on a bus and send them somewhere where you don't even know where the, you know, straight. So we were not really addressing the problem, I think is what I want to say. And, and unfortunately that with all the turmoil that ensued, the busing, the, the, the riots and the violence and the divisive um, fights that uh, political battles that went on, um, 
in 2000, this was back in 1967 or 1970, 78. And here we are in 2018 and the Boston schools have become resegregated. So I, the point I wanna make is that was not a real solution. It wasn't a real solution. It was not a systemic solution. And I think what we have to sort of strive for as we're, as we're looking for equality and equity, and those two things are distinct, is how we bring about uh, systemic change. One of the, um, the, 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 the results of the problem of, in the systemic racism that exists in Boston is this incredible wealth disparity. Median net worth of a non-immigrant African-American household uh, is $8 lowest in five city uh, study. And then you can see the contrast to the $247,000 net worth for white households in the Boston area. This was part of a, a, a study conducted, conducted by the Boston Globe. When they printed this, they realized they had to, they actually had to make sure that people realized that what they were saying was true. And this is, this is actually from the article. This was no typo. The median net worth of black Bostonians is $8. Just think about that in any way that you can in terms of what you would do if there were an emergency or if there was a catastrophe or anything out of the ordinary throws those households into turmoils. And so here we are uh, sort of looking at the difference, obviously, between equality which um, and equity. And equality means you have access to the lunch counter. Equity means but I don't have enough money to buy a hamburger. So, uh, you know, and talking about the, the, the issues that, that were facing the communities uh, of color are around the country. Let's talk about land um, uh, and the access to land, you know, and, and, and the, even the buried systemic biases with regard to that. Following the Second World War, most people know about the GI Bill, which benefits that granted people the opportunity to um, get low interest mortgages and in fact contributed to the creation of suburbs and or uh, white flight from the inner city to the suburbs. The GI Bill, a new deal for veterans, guaranteed loans unless you were an African-American. And this was an article recently and you know how GI Bill's promise was denied to millions of black World War II veterans. So while in, you had a uh, a, a bill and a piece of legislation that ostensibly was available to everyone. Um, in reality, it wasn't. And it this is a my my dad who got the letter signed from uh, by Harry Truman thanking him for his service, but um, was not able to access the GI Bill when it came time um, for us to look for um, um, a home. Um, the great book by Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law, which again, you can read it for yourself, but it shows that law and policies um, that were making it difficult for people of color to access land was actually embedded in law. So it's not something that people were just indiscriminately or on their own deciding that we will do this. It is really sort of a, um, as he calls it, a forgotten history, a hard government segregated America. I'm, I'm bringing this up because we can't solve problems unless we confront the reality and understand historically how we arrived at this particular place. And this is just another, this was from even further back where you could see many people were not at all embarrassed or reticent about um, posting um, uh, their uh, desires and their intent to halt the integration of cities. Um, Banks were in the same um, uh, category in terms of how they were, how they issued loans and how they made uh, funds available to folks and um, or of color. And it was, uh, again, in many cases, in one instance, just not making them available. But if you did make them available, you did so with the onerous sort of um, interest rates and all that made them once again prohibitive. I'm going to talk about how that affected us and did affect us a great deal. This is a picture of my family in Tennessee right before they made the great migration. Uh, it's my mom in the front and left and um, the defiant woman in the dark um, uh, dress. Um, that's my grandmother. Um, and she was big mama. 
we are matriarch, we were <laughs> still our matriarchal family, and that we made the great migration to Cleveland, Ohio. And th th by the way, this was in uh, Trenton, Tennessee, northeast corner of, of Tennessee. And they came to Ohio. The first part of that is they wanted to escape the South, Jim Crow South. So they're going to get out. You don't, if you didn't have a car, the way that you got out was used, probably the two main factors were um, where do the buses and or trains take you uh, from Tennessee, somewhere out of Tennessee to the north. It could be to the west, but out of Jim Crow South. And two, do we have relatives living anywhere that we might be able to sort of go and live with? And in, in our case, we had an uncle or had a relative who lived in Collinwood, Ohio, worked for the railroads. So my family said when they packed up and decided to get out, they it was Ohio, we wound up in Cleveland. Um, I wanted to do that. This is a Google uh, shot kind of, of uh, my street, East 88th Street in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I didn't have a shot that showed the neighborhood as it actually existed. So I took the liberty of adding um, the um, neighbors and kind of give you a sense of the vibrancy of, of my, my community growing up. Um, this shot shows an overhead shot. That's our house, 2342 East 88th Street. And that's my grandmother and grandfather uh, in the corner there. What you'll notice when, when I grew up, um, our house, I felt we were very special because our house was right in the middle of the street. I thought that was like, great. We were sort of like, you know, center centerpiece. But as you can see now, we're now the first house you encounter on the corner. The rest of the houses have been torn down um, for various reasons. In most cases, our neighborhood, when people die, their homes died with them. Uh, and the other aspect of that was the economic development, um, the economy of the neighborhood completely um, tanked when Republic Steel tanked. And so we lost our anchor. Before that, we were well, an incredibly vibrant neighborhood and community uh, uh, and, and locally owned restaurants, barber shops, grocery stores, um, homeowners. And I, I, it's, it's hard for me to describe what we were. I don't, couldn't call it upper middle class, couldn't call it middle class. It just was a solid neighborhood. My grandmother, by the way, was, um, when she came back in Tennessee, she was a teacher, unofficially a teacher, but she was very smart. She taught, she didn't have a certificate. She came to um, Ohio and she became a housemaid at Statler Hilton. And that's what she did for all of her life. The, the, when I asked her how she was able to get a mortgage, she was always reluctant to talk about the mortgage, but it was sort of clear afterwards that she got it, but she got, a, and it was really sort of one of the at exorbitant rates. But the other thing about the mortgage was that you could lose it in a blink uh, with either a late payment, certainly a missed payment could mean that you, you could lose your home. So there was that sort of pressure. And I can honestly tell you in all the years, and I grew up with her in all the years, and we lived together in, in the house, she never missed a day of work. Now that's not to say she was never sick. She never missed a day of work for fear. So this is because she knew that land, we all know land is a source of wealth. And it's, and it's, it's the beginning of building your source, your, your, your wealth, and certainly, um, that you could pass on to your children and your grandchildren. That is really sort of your goal. So she died before I discovered this. The, the home is still there in Cleveland. And I inquired, my half sister lives there. So, but take a look at this. When I inquired about the value of the property today. So after buying, coming up from Tennessee, buying this land, working day in and day out for all of her life, um, because the community um, devalued, our house at this point was worth $19,400. Now, I think anyone will know what that means is that you've got a place that you, anytime anything goes wrong with the house, you realize you, you just feel like you're pouring, right? It's money down a black hole, but, but my sister's in a position where she can't afford some other place, so she's still living there. And it's, it's a dilemma. And it's, it's one that says to me, this isn't working. And so the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, got to be real quick here, I think is a better model. R located in the heart of, of Boston, it really is a center. Roxbury, Dorchester, right near the expressway. Um, uh, it's near the, near the airport. Um, in um, the early 70s, the 
city of Boston targeted that area, Dorchester, Roxbury, for urban renewal. And the residents knew that back then the, the, the slogan was urban renewal means Negro removal, that you're going to build it up. The plan was for marinas and for uh, condominiums. The, 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 the residents convinced Mayor Ray Flint not to, be, not to go ahead with the urban renewal. And what happened was that the slumlords and landowners who were waiting to cash in when the city purchased the land to, re, re, to, to, to implement their urban renewal program, the, um, they torched their buildings to collect insurance to minimize the loss. The community, in this case, the Dudley community was reduced to about 1400 vacant lots. The city was devastated. You, you, look, you could stand in the middle and you'd turn around and you look like you were in a, in, in a war zone. And this is a little bit, these are some of the better shots of what the community was re reduced to as a result of the arson for profit. Arson for profit was only one of the insults that they had to deal with. There was redlining, there was outright racism, discrimination, but this is sort of the, the, the aftermath. So we're going to talk about now sort of get on a, on a pauser check and talk about how this what the, this community did to turn itself around. I always said this was a, a great article and I just use it to kind of give you a sense of what um, uh, the, the, the accomplishment was. But I do want to emphasize that it was not so much stopping gentrification. And once again, it was finding a formula or a way of getting around that dilemma of gentrification leading to displacement. You'll see community land trust was one of the tools that we we put into place. The organization that, that came together to engineer and design a strategy and a plan for revitalization to avoid that dilemma was called the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. They didn't give themselves the names of Boston. There were a couple of philanthropies and um, uh, city departments that had put together a strategy and a um, fundraising effort to come in and help the city but when confronted by residents who said, how many of you that are working on this plan live here? And when not a single one raised their hand, Shay Madian is a single mom convinced them to take the money that they had raised and give it to the community. And then when they asked, well, what would the community do with this? Shay, who was not in the position at the time to, to say exactly what, do, what they would do, he said, I think the first thing we would uh, do though is, hire an organizer to go out and canvas the city and or canvas the community and ask the residents what they would like to see. And this is what I call sort of radical civics. They came up with a comprehensive plan. And I don't know if anybody who's a, had any experience with community organizing, this is the, the plan, but it, it was an amazing process, not community involvement, community engagement, community immersion. Um, we actually, uh, and, and, and we, the, the, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative was community-based grassroots planning entity, not a community development corporation. Our mission was not to develop, our mission was to plan. And we felt it was important to keep that distinction between the planning entity and the people who did the building for sort of obvious reasons. But we engaged everybody, including the youth. And one of the great projects was we actually got the MIT to uh, loan us the services of one of the first um, 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 uh, 3D printers. This thing was about as, the size of a house uh, at, at MIT. But they, they just churned out uh, every building every and every uh, 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 building in our neighborhood as you do, right? Cities do that. They do their planning. They come up with their models. But this was our model. This was the community's model. And the, and the youth were involved in, in doing everything from painting to actually laying out the whole bit. But it got everybody more familiar and invested in our neighborhood. And then we had community meetings over and over. We, the goal, the goal was to create a shared vision. And I know that sounds, it's, it's so important that you, you go through the process and I think we may have probably done more to uh, keep post-its in business than any other single entity in the world because you had walls. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those, those were our walls. I mean, you had them, but it was brainstorming. 
It was planning and, and um, just an incredible process. Um, when it came to talking about economic development, people would say, we don't, who are we? We don't know what economic development means. How, how can we even begin that conversation? And the process that we instilled, it was sort of interesting. We asked people, we got everybody in a room. We asked them to close their eyes, envision that they were on Dudley Street, our main street in the summer. It was warm, it was pleasant. They're sitting out on a, on a, a park bench. They opened their eyes and they felt safe. What did they see? And then they would say, well, we, we see people. I, we said it was nine o'clock in the evening. We see people walking. I said, well, where are they walking from? Why are they in the street? Well, they're at restaurants or they're coming from it. We just got that conversation going. So you don't need to be technically explicit. You just need to understand the feel for your community and what you're trying to do. The radical civic says that we're gonna come up with our own declaration community of rights. This is what we as residents uh, are looking for. And by the way, the Dudley Street neighborhood is not an official, anything like an official census tract or any official neighborhood in, the, in, in Boston. The neighborhood came up and they said, this is who we are. These are our boundaries. And um, it was, um, it, and, and posed that to the city. So they got the plan, they got the vision, they, they, they got people together, they still didn't have the land. Process by which they got the land was they convinced the mayor of Boston to grant them the power of eminent domain over all abandoned vacant land in their community. People know what the eminent domain. And um, that's the, that's the vehicle that cities use to force people out of their neighborhoods, to build highways, to divide neighborhoods. The city, the neighborhood was so desperate. And by the way, the, the community didn't come up with this just on their own. They allied, allied themselves with lawyers and, and sympathetic planners who said, you've got to get the land. You're never going to be able to revitalize this. You're never going to be able to realize your vision without the land. So you're going to need some extraordinary measure. They went to Mayor Ray Flynn. Ray Flynn had just lost, won a contentious mayoral battle with Mel King. Mel King was the first black candidate ever to run for mayor of Boston. Well, I've mentioned it at the outset that we had court ordered busing, which was divisive. The mayor felt desperate and that he wanted to regain support or gain support from the black community. So at a public meeting, he said, um, I will give you anything you need anything you need. Do you need plastic bags and rakes to clean up there? Tell me what you need. And the uh, Shea and the rest of the residents got up and said, we, we want the power of eminent domain over all abandoned vacant land. They got it. They got it. And I will tell you this, I think they got, well, two things that happened. They got it um, because I, I, I in, in part, uh, because it really was necessary, but also in part because I do think, and this is just my opinion, the city probably after negotiating wrangling and all surmised that they would probably fail. And if they failed, um, they would be able to say, we gave them everything. We gave them, you know, uh, we even gave them this unprecedented power, which then would have left the door open for them to come in with their urban renewal plan. But they didn't. And one of the reasons is that we had this incredible form of governance. This was again, I'm sort of talking now about the uh, this 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 combination of, of radical civics and what I call civil anarchy. We had our own. Our board was a thirty member board of directors, thirty members: uh, African American, Latino, Cape Verdean, white, which was sort of the makeup, the multicultural makeup of the community. That all poor for the most part. Um, they were represented. Churches were represented. Businesses were represented. I was there for four years as executive director. A 30, I don't know if anybody dealt with 40, 30 member board of directors, but we met the first Wednesday of every month, 30 members, and never was there a question of a quorum because people knew that they were deciding and determining the fate of their community, right? They weren't just coming to talk. They were actually saying, here's where we want um, this parcel. We want this parcel of land. We want to put this out to bid and we will invite the developers. And this was a total flip. The developers had to come to St. Patrick's Church and make their presentation to the community about their plans for building and then quite be questioned by the community. It was a placemaking 
experience. And as I said, we didn't have a, we were our own, when I say our, I was only there for four years. I don't want to, don't want to sound, take, take too much credit for this, but they, they, they created their own space that was in the image that they solved themselves. And so we put out something called the state of the village, because we, since the city didn't know who we were, I mean, didn't have a census uh, assessment of who we were, we had to create our own sense of space. So this was that, um, the, the area I said, all the black or the, the vacant parcels. These are the parcels that came under the control of the uh, land trust. And I think in all the years subsequent to this, and this was dating back to around the, you know, the, the mid, uh, late 70s, early 80s, I think there's only been one forfeiture, one, one mortgage that's defaulted. Um, and that sort of gives you, here you go, the, the, the sort of the build up there. I wonder quickly, because I'm running out of time here, this is, you kind of get a sense, those vacant lots are filled with affordable homes, um, urban agriculture. The key uh, to uh, avoid that dilemma, again, displacement, was putting the land under a community land trust. And that was a big, big deal because it, it meant that the, the residents said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what do you mean we don't own the land? And you know, the ex you know, explanation was, you own your home uh, and would give you a 99 year lease on the, the property. But it took a lot of discussion for people to understand that that was okay, that that was not going to um, thwart their ability to build wealth. But the thing that we, that, that was proposed to them that would in fact limit their wealth was the fact that said in order for us to avoid displacement and speculation, we're going to have to, um, imp we're going to voluntarily make the value of our land and the houses on it um, less than the surrounding areas, less than, than, than the going market price, because that's the way we're going to be able to discourage speculation. In essence, what it said was, we're going to put the community first. We're going to preserve the community, build the community wealth by preserving the land, but you're going to probably take a little bit of a sacrifice and people did it. It was pretty amazing that they accepted that and then put the efforts into, again, really building this. So the town common. The town common was designed by the youth. The town, the, the space, I'm almost out of time, the space where the town common now rests was formerly the place where prostitution and drug dealing took place. And this, 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 this little piece on the left there says fighting crime by design was an article that we wrote to show how we were using design and planning and, and, and designing of our space uh, rather to actually control and, and uh, crime in the neighborhood. And it did work. And unfortunately, because we were just a little island, it meant that our success really just pushed the crime and the drug dealing to other parts of Boston, but that really wasn't our, we didn't have the ability to go beyond our own community. I want to say the land, so that was the housing piece. We also had a big urban agriculture piece. The thing I want to point out here is that um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, has uh, reported, and we probably, uh, you probably already know this, but 98% of the agricultural land in the United States is owned by whites. 98% of the agricultural land. That hasn't always been the case, obviously, because um, there was a time when there were many black farmers, uh, particularly in the South, but 11 million acres lost through fraud, deception, outright theft. So you look at the urban piece where, again, GI bills, embedded um, systemic racism prevents land ownership in the city. And now you've got this, a situation, a mirror situation in um, the um, on agriculture, but that didn't thwart attempts to build a strong urban agriculture program. Um, this is Mel King, the, the, the individual I met, mentioned who ran against Ray Flynn for mayor of Boston, lost, but then became probably more powerful as, a, as an organizer and a mentor throughout. It just just kind of gives you a sense of the, um, how important agriculture was. This is a real paper, but the Boston Globe, others, Massachusetts was in the process of um, losing its farmland and farmers at an alarming rate dating back to uh, the end of the Second World War. So there were all sorts of efforts to try to revitalize agriculture. Um, and it, a lot of that did happen in the city. 
Um, the Boston Urban Gardeners did a lot of community organizing. It was a struggle again. I was really interested to see that in, um, in, the, in the UK, they have a, a program called an allotment program that makes land available to community gardeners uh, at a small fee. We don't have that. I don't think much in the US. They certainly have it in Boston. So it was up to community organizers, not the state to figure out how to get people on the land. And the Boston Urban Gardeners were so successful that the US Department of Agriculture created a, a, an extension service office in the city, Suffolk County, the first city to get an extension office because there was so much agriculture going on. Dudley Street came up with a, um, um, a plan. We put that in place. This is when I was there. I do wanna show you uh, and, and what the kind of things that happened there. This was a Brook Avenue garage, a former you know, um, car garage, spilling oil, polluted. We got some money from the Mass Highway Department as part of a competitive process. We took that money to take tear down the, um, the garage and put in a 10,000 square foot greenhouse that is now a centerpiece in the community. And it is um, um, operated by a nonprofit group called Food Project, but it really has become a source of real pride in the community. Our biggest concern now, as I end, is that um, maybe, and this was done a while back, so I'm not quite sure what we're gonna see dynamics now with, with COVID and other things going on, but there was, has been an influx of folks who left the city back, coming back to the city. And as they did, they began to take advantage of the amenities that had been sort of um, struggled for and created by the residents who stayed behind. One of them was working with the city of Boston, uh, Mayor Menino at that time. The organizers worked for two and a half years to convince the city to rezone the city of Boston to, pro to allow commercial farming. And, and that's a big deal, right? You get Zoning is key to sort of saying, this is what the city allows. And for the city to say, we are now zoned for agriculture uh, was a big deal. But those who are probably taking most advantage of it are now sort of high finance, and I'll say high finance white entrepreneurs who are coming in and with great ideas, but freight farms and vertical farms and that are highly capital intensive, that once again are out of the reach of most of the low income community that we were designing these programs for. So it is a bit of a dilemma. We're still, the, 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 the you, you never sort of get to the end of the, challenges that you're facing. But I will say that the program, highly, incredibly successful. And as, as Bucky himself said, as you get better and better at pro problem solving, what you encounter probably is not utopia, you encounter more difficult problems. And that's not pessimistic, it's sort of a reality. Um, I'm just going to end by just sort of saying that there has been a a lot of analysis that kind of gives us a sense is, has this program actually really worked? And a student at MIT for his master's thesis really did a both a GIS and, an, a, and a statistical analysis to show us that the, this little island this really was buffeted, really was a, a successful attempt at um, civil anarchy. We created our own little sort of space in there and the idea, obviously, is hopefully that people can see that this can be replicated, at least the process. Two things that can't be, one thing that can't be replicated probably is uh, eminent domain. So I do think the real value with Dudley Street is demonstrating what can happen when residents are in control of the land and their planning process, because they live there, um, is, is the rolling piece. And so the question is, are there alternative means for getting funds that would allow these communities to purchase land. And we're actually getting some ideas from the UK that does have something like a community land fund and a right of first refusal for residents um, to purchase derelict and abandoned land. So we're kind of looking at some of those examples. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Greg. You know, you're, what you're talking about here and your entire presentation, I think it puts so much into context for people when we're talking about systemic racism and what that really means and how it's being experienced. People are very, very disconnected from the real and personal stories and how it connects the past to where we are right now. If you can't really see it with your own eyes, 
then it doesn't exist for you. And your presentation, I think that it just really solidifies that it exists now and it will continue to exist if we don't make some really dramatic changes. And for me personally, the, uh, the connection between dispossession and land and, and where we have to go uh, is, is just so incredibly real right now. I am so grateful to you. Um, I know we have some questions that are coming up in our panel here. Um, Susan said um, that this is an amazing story. Um, this may be a better question for your breakout, but wondering if we can draw some connections between your conversation with George on revisioning land ownership with also the reflection on how indigenous communities can move forward. Um, so thinking about how we can do that together. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And I, I think, you know, this is the the tools. And here's here's one of the things that I find a little frustrating is that when you um, do try to tell the story, and I feel a little frustrated because I you, you could probably tell I was rushing through it because it's it, it you really need to sort of really sort of lay it lay it out because I think the in um, almost all cases both the devil and the angels are in the details and and all too often you see the big picture and people say well yeah that's great but um they got the power of eminent domain and we can't get that that was the most important thing they did no the 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 power given the power of eminent domain was not the most important part of that story the most important part was they asked for it and see, what, what usually happens is you, you come up with a strategy and you say, well, where are we now? What's the next step? And all the next steps seem to be totally out of reach. And you, ne you, you never take that really important step. And by the way, you mentioned the past and the context. It, the, what made this happen, you've also got to be aware of what is the current political, cultural, social environment. What is it possible to do now? And if people get caught up with saying, but in order to replicate this, I've got to do exactly the sort of things that are happening there. You know, what Bucky would have said is no, the, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is a special case. The general principles that you got to, what are the principles that you can pull out of that? The steps that, that would allow you to come up with your own solution. But you, you understand what I'm saying? But not get, not understand that the key was gaining access to the land. What is it? So what is your situation may require or call upon you um, marshalling a different set of resources? You didn't may not have a Ray Flynn or a Mel King or the history of, of segregated busing, but you probably have other issues, which is why your understanding, and you put it so well, your understanding of the past. You got to bring the, the, the past into the present so that it can inform the future. Yeah, absolutely. If, if without that context, you don't understand kind of the emotional devastation of the, the, the people and how they can start to believe that they can't, that they don't have access or that it's not worth the energy because there's so many doors closed over time. Yeah, so, and you may have other questions. The only thing I want to point out too is the conversations before this, which are really important in terms of climate change and permaculture and all, I, you will find residents of these communities ready and willing and open for these discussions. I, I thought that talking about systems thinking, I say, okay, well, how am I gonna do this? I'm, no, the community was there. They knew exactly, I mean, they may not have called that, but those post-its were that, and then you start drawing, right? The, the, the line together. So they were system thinking. We we took a group. I don't know if this may, I'm going to give away my age here, but we took a group to MIT to see um, Jay Forrester. Jay Forrester was the guru of systems thinking. He wrote industrial you know dynamics and city dynamics, urban dynamics. And he was humbled that we asked for a meeting with him um, because he said, what do I have to offer this community? You know, he said, I, I don't know what I... They came in and talked to him, and he basically, at least his, his advice to us was, you've created a system here that is way too attractive. You're going to have to put in some negative factors to thwart the 
speculation. He said that will come, which was in part what happened, right? When and and when when the community suggested that they wanted to limit and put a cap on the of the value of their properties that was below um, the current market, you know what? One of our biggest the biggest challenges was finding a bank that would accept that because <laughs> banks said, "What well, are you crazy? Who's going to buy a home under those conditions?" And what the community said people who want to live here, not people who want to speculate. So there was a lot of back and forth education that, that had to happen, including educating institutions like philanthropies and banks and governments about why this could work. Even the Ford Foundation said, you're crazy. How, why, are you, why are you restricting the, commu the community's ability to build wealth? And we said, we're not restricting, we actually are building community wealth. What we're asking the residents to do is for a period of time, not forever, by the way, that wasn't forever, but for a shorter, a longer period of time than was normal to restrict and, and, and limit the, the value of your land. It's a different set of values. It's a different perspective of, of, of everything, right? But you have to tap that. And I think that's the same thing that we're talking about in, when, you, when it comes to resilience sustainability, You're, you've got to get people to change their minds, right? Or no, you have to help them <laughs> discover that they need to create and, and, and be able to step into a different perspective. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I think um, we have another more of a comment. Actually, Peter, you can unmute and um, you have a comment here. Um, about Danella and Dennis Meadows. Yeah, uh, Greg mentioned Jay Forrester and the yeah. Dudley Street neighbors uh, going in. Jay Forrester is sort of the, the modern uh, famous guru of systems thinking. He really pioneered it in, um, at MIT. And among his students were Donella and Dennis Meadows, who with Jürgen Ronders wrote later in 1972, the very famous book, Limits to Growth. They, it's been republished and revisited, and it laid out uh, something of a warning and a roadmap for the 21st century, saying that we would face ecological limits and that they would impinge on economic growth and that we would be heading in if we didn't change our, our um, treatment of land and resources and people and make different arrangements in society economically we would be in very, very serious trouble from the 20s and 30s of this century onward into the 2040s, which their model predicted as a time of absolute disaster. We're on the cusp of that and we need to make changes now. So it's, you know, what, what systems thinking offers us and it's underneath permaculture and it's underneath what Greg's been doing in the community and it's underneath many of our best efforts is we're integrating many, many variables all at once in real time that science hasn't uh, wrapped its head around terribly well until the last you know, few generations. You know, we started with medicine in the early part of the, ninth, the 20th century and looking at vitamins and looking at factors that interacted in a subtle way with health. And now we're into, oh, people's attitudes and the sets of laws we use and the state of the resources on a particular piece of ground determine whether people are gonna live or die and how long they're gonna live and what uh, what outcomes we're going to get socially, and we have to suddenly get a lot smarter if we're really going to go forward. That's really the upshot of it. Thank you so much for this beautiful, beautiful presentation, Greg. Well, well thank you. And I guess one last word, I will say that that what you what you found was that also similar to our ecological discussions of diversity, diversity was totally emphasized in this in in this strategy, right? And and we saw our multicultural um, makeup as the, one of the greatest strengths of that community uh, rather than sort of seeing it as, as a reason. And, and again, we had to sort of find ways to understand each other's cultures and understand when someone resisted this notion that I can't, what do you mean I can't own land? We found that the, the many in the Latino community, and this is just, just happened to be that way, said, no, we, we don't understand, no, <laughs> we want to own the land. But, um, but it was the entire community that just kept, we got to sit down and we won't move forward until everybody feels comfortable. And it wasn't a matter of badgering, it was a matter of education. And, and when that happened, boom, the community as a whole moved forward. So yeah. there, there's that lesson as well. So anyway, I thank you, Susan, for allowing me to uh, uh, 
be here and to, to be a part of this discussion. Greg, do you have a book that's either in the works or current? I've had a book in the works forever, but here's the book that you need. No, I'm serious. The book you need is um, Streets of Hope by um, um, Peter Medoff and Holly Sklar. And it is the definitive uh, history of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, and um, that's the one you should, I, I just strongly suggest you buy. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll look And there's also a video book. called Holding Ground, by Holding the way. Ground, okay. Holding Ground. Well, um, I'd and also like to mention for those who aren't coming to Greg's um, breakout later on today that uh, the Schumacher Center for whom, um, uh, well, whom Greg partners with, I should say, are, um, wrote or published a white paper recently on the black commons which is really awesome and and there's a big conversation about using the community land trust model to sort of redress historical and current wrongs so i would really encourage folks to look at the schumacher center as well with with gifted land as being sort of a center point of of that and that has both its advantages and, and, and drawbacks as well but it is very important to do that and schumacher center by the way has a vast online open library of, mm -hmm. of, of, of references and mostly um, the um, transcripts from their 40 years of annual lectures, but it's Wendell Berry to West Jackson to John Todd to you name it. And they've, they, they, they've been to George Monbiot has just been the more recent. So um, no, that's, that's stuff in print. Yeah. Really? So well, thanks. Right.